Suna Baba Protectors of the Suna Suna Baba Protectors of the Suna Ina Allaham Duty Law, Wasalab, Wasalam Allah, Wadrasul Allah. Welcome to um, another session. And by the way, this is going to, going to be our final session of the series of Paradise and Hell. Inshallah, today we're going to uh, cover the, the um, we're going to end this session or this series on Paradise and Hell because we basically covered everything that Allah uh, wants us to know about these two entities. And uh, before I do uh, the last lecture of this, I do have a quiz I want to give you because this quiz helps to summarize what we need to know about what the people of paradise will indulge in or engage in if they're fortunate enough to make it there. And let's put the quiz up on the screen. Um, I did post it on uh, Facebook as well. So hopefully you guys had a chance to look at it and try to answer it. I tried to keep it brief. I tried to make it true or false, basically. Let's look at the first question, true or false? The people of paradise will not be able to see into the hellfire. Is that statement true or false? Who can answer it? True or false, the people of paradise will not be able to see inside it. Go ahead, Anissa. That is false. Uh, a prophet of Islam said that we, the people of paradise, will see the people in hell. Yeah, we'll give us to talk with them. Yeah, yeah, give us some um evidence, some uh, hadith. Uh, we'll be able to talk with them, and we will point fingers at them. We will laugh at them when they were treating us uh, wrong on earth. We'll be able to let them know how we feel now. Look at us. Look at you. Look at us. Okay, so this answer is true. This answer is false. Allah and the Prophet وسلم, speak about it because Allah speaks about it in the Quran too. How the people of paradise will be able to point out those in hell who harmed them in this world. Many hadiths on that and verses of the Quran. Good job. Okay, who can answer question number two? Question number two, true or false, the people of hell will be able to see Allah. Hands up, please. Who can answer this question? True or false, the people of hell will be able to see Allah. What do you guys think? Hands up. Who would like to answer that? The people of hell will be able to see Allah. Go ahead, Sister Malion. I would say false. The Prophet Sallallahu basically told us that only the people of paradise will um, see Allah's face. And on the day of judgment, Allah is going to wear a veil so that the unbelievers won't see his face. Exactly. This is Hadith and Quran. The Hadith and the Quran. The Prophet and the Quran says how on the day how after the people of paradise enter, Allah will remove, Allah will remove the veil from himself and the people of paradise will see, but the people of hell will not so this is something that a lot of muslims ask about and the answer is only the people of paradise will see allah tells us this in the quran that he will remove the veil from himself 
and expose himself to the people of paradise as a means of letting them know that he's happy with them and content with them. But the people of the hellfire will never be able to uh, look upon the face of Allah. Why should they? When this is a great, the greatest reward of all. Okay, let's look at question number three. We had a lot of people ask me about the jinn yesterday. Now I did the whole series on the jinn. Before I even spoke about paradise and hell, we talked about the jinn and we discussed this stuff about the jinn. Okay, true or false, there will be no jinn in paradise. Let's see who can remember. True or false, there will be no jinn in paradise. Sister Fame, Sister Habiba, Sister um, Brother Tarek, Sister Awa, Sister Aisho, Istarling, Jamila. True or false, there will be no jinn in paradise. Uh, Sister Rockmo, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Rockmo, go ahead. It's false. Okay, you have any evidence? Allah said he um, prepared the hellfire for both jinn and mankind. Okay, Allah says he prepared paradise and hell for jinn and men. We have to remember that, and we talked about that for the sister that asked that question. We, we talked about the jinn. You know, the jinn, either they're going to end up in paradise or they're going to end up in hell. So the, the jinn will be in paradise too. Okay. All right, let's look at the next question. Question number four, true or false, the jinn will not marry in paradise. This is another question that the sisters asked, and we talked about this before too when we did our series on the jinn. True or false? The jinn will not marry in paradise. That's Come on, people. Sister Fahme, go ahead. Okay, so um, guys, no, wait a minute, hold on. Wait a minute, who's on the mic? Jamila, go ahead. Go ahead, Jamila. Oh. True or false, the jinn will not marry Jamila. Okay, she turned her mic off. Okay, wait a minute, hold on. Now I'm trying. Uh, false. Okay, it's false. Can you give me some evidence? What's some evidence that the jinn will marry in paradise? Can anyone give me some evidence? What's the evidence that they will marry? Sister uh, Fame, what's the evidence that the jinn will marry in paradise? Go ahead, Fame. A lot tells, a lot tells us that the elderly will be prepared for not only the men, but also the jinn that make it to paradise. Exactly. Allah tells us in the Quran that the El Hurin are prepared for the men and jinn of this world. Allah says, you know, the women who man who has not yet been touched by man or jinn. Remember, guys, so the jinn will be marrying the El Hurin too. The El Hurin are not just a reward for the men of this world, they're rewards for the jinn too, the believing jinn. Okay, next question. Question number five. True or false, the jinn will not have palaces or any of the things promised in paradise. True or false? Is this true or false? All the things promised in paradise are not for the jinn. Is that true or false? And again, we talked about the jinn in detail. But see, what happens is a lot of people join my classes and they miss out on those other classes. So these sisters wanted to know, and we, I'm going to have you guys answer to see if you remember. True or false, the jinn will not have palaces or any of the things we Allah mentions in the Quran. True or false, uh, uh, Latifa, Khadijah, Istarling, Medina, Marianne, Beryl. Come on, who can answer? Marianne, go ahead. True or false? Um, I'm going to say that it's going to be false because just like we're rewarded in paradise, the gems are also rewarded. Just like there's good humans and bad humans, the good gems get rewarded just like we do. Exactly. Remember, Allah says paradise has been prepared as a reward for men and gems. 
men and gin. So everything there will be experienced by the, the gin too, those that die believing in Allah. Good job. So the jinn, you know, paradise. They, remember, we talked about how the jinn, other than us, the only creation of Allah besides human that are held accountable are the jinn, because Iblis was just as arrogant as man. Iblis accepted free will just like Adam did. Okay. The rest of the creation of Allah refused it. The angels didn't want it. The sun, the moon, the animals, the, you know, the insects, the birds, they didn't want that gift of free will. But Iblis took it because Iblis is arrogant. And Adam took it too because it's the nature of the man to be attracted to that that can be harmful to you too. So jinn are held accountable for their choices in life just as we are. Okay, so yes, paradise is their reward, just like hell is their reward too. I mean, their punishment too. Okay, let's look at question number seven. Oh, no, it's number six. True or false, we will not be able to see the jinn in the hereafter. In other words, even though the jinn will enter paradise with us, we won't see them. We will not be able to see the jinn in their original form. Is that true or false? Who can answer that? Which is another question that was asked. True or false? Go ahead, Anissa. Alhamdulillah, if I can remember, yes, we will be able to see them in their original form. Excuse me, you said you can't I, remember what? I, no, I said, yes, I think we will, see, from, from Hadith, I believe Hadith says we will see them in their original form. What Hadith? Okay, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, anybody else want to answer this question? Will we be, we will not be able to see the jinn in the hereafter, true or false? Every one of you Muslims listening to me should know this answer. It's a simple question. Latifa, Marianne, go ahead. Go ahead, Marianne. Um, I think this is false because we will be able to see them because they're part of the unseen world. And yeah, we'll get to see them just like we'll get to see the angels. Exactly, guys. Common sense. That's what once, I thought I said. I messed up. Okay. Uh, common sense. Once we die, we enter into the hereafter. The hereafter is not Elber Zot. That's not part of the seen world. That's part of the unseen world. Okay. We'll be able to see the angels, the jinn, and we're going to even get to see Allah, subhanAllah. Okay, so yes, we'll see them. But as the prophet told Aisha, because Aisha, this is the hadith I thought somebody would remember. You know, the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, explained how on the day of judgment, we will all be raised up from the dead, barefoot, naked, and uncircumcised the jinn as well. And his wife, Aisha said, will we be able to see the jinn? And the prophet said, of course, but you will not care what they look like. You will be so concerned with trying to save your soul from the hellfire that you could care less about how that jinn looked that's standing next to you. But yes, we'll be raised up from the dead and so will the jinn. We'll all be barefoot, naked and standing next to each other. But just like the jinn could care less about what you look like, you ain't gonna care about what they look like because we're gonna be too busy trying to get our way out of hell. So yes, this is false. We will be able to see them and everything else. Okay, no more screens in the hereafter. There is no more veils uh, uh, in the hereafter. Even Allah is going to unveil. Okay, let's look at this next question. This is a scenario. Abdullah says that the people of paradise will be able to pick out the people who hurt them in the hellfire and make fun of them. The Imam tells him this is not correct because there is no making fun of others in the hereafter. Because before any of us enter paradise, our hearts will be purified of stuff like that. So who's correct, Abdullah or the Imam? 
who can take this answer? Go ahead, Latifa. Okay. Abdullah is correct because we talked about that it would be poetic justice for the believers. And it says, if I have it correct, that we will be sitting on thrones laughing, sitting on high thrones laughing at those who mocked us. Exactly. Allah says in the Quran that we will sit on high thrones of dignity and we'll pick out the people in hell who used to harm us in this world. And we will ask them, have you found the promise of your Lord to be true? And there's other verses too. So yes, that we will. And this is different. There's no we, there's no making fun of, of, of each other. We're all, we will enter paradise, our hearts purified, and we will be brothers and sisters in faith as we should have been in this world. There will be no hurtful feelings towards each other. But the unbelievers are different. They are the enemies of Allah. They are our enemies. Many of you will pick out your family members. Many of you will see your parents burning in the fire. And you will say to them, mom, didn't I try to tell you? Didn't I tell you that Jesus Christ was not your God and you didn't listen? You'll be able to speak even to your family members. Okay, this is different. This is not animosity amongst the believers. This is the poetic justice that Allah gives us to those who harm us and also your way of proving to your family too. You know, you call me crazy. I told you that the Bible didn't exist. I told you the Torah didn't exist. You should have listened. Because I'm going to tell y'all too, the people of hell will be screaming for you to intercede for them. Your parents, your relatives who are being punished in that fire, they'll be screaming out, hey, you are my son. Can you help me? And you will tell them, no, you had your chance. You know, I talked about Islam to you. You refuse to believe in Allah. I can't help you. There is no help uh, for you. You are, this is your choice. You chose the hellfire. So yes, we'll be able to um, not only mock the people who uh, harmed us, but you'll even be speaking to your relatives in there. You'll be telling them, don't you wish you had to listen to me? All of that. Okay, let's look at question number eight. True or false, the obligations in this world remain the same in paradise. For example, we are obligated to pray and we are obligated to fast during the month of Ramadan. So we will pray and we will fast the month of Ramadan in paradise out of obligation. Who can answer this? This is another debate that ignorant Muslims have. Go ahead, Latifa. Okay, this is true. We will continue on with our prayer, prayers and everything. And we will not only uh, do that, but we'll do a lot of be for being so thankful that we made it, you know, to paradise and that we had a lost favor and blessing. Okay, pay attention to the question. The question uh, is the obligations of this world will remain the same in paradise as here. We are obligated to pray five times a day. We're obligated to fast the month of Ramadan. What else? We're obligated to make Hajj. You know, that's the question. Will it remain the same? Who else had their hand up? Go ahead, uh, somebody besides Anissa. Anyone else? Dahere, Fatima, Norto, Nana, Precious, you other people, Bricks. Somebody, Rashida, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, um, 
we we are not going to be obligated, but everything else that Latifa said is true. We're going to want to do it because we're so grateful to Allah that he blessed us to um, enter paradise. Okay, y'all need to catch the words, key words. Obligation means I have to do something. So this statement is false. Why is it false? Why is it that we don't have these obligations anymore? Who can answer that? Why is it, AY, that we are no longer obligated to do these, to pray and fast and do these things? Um, because uh, we already earn the love of Allah and we're just doing it um, because this is something that we enjoy doing in, in this Okay, world. forget the enjoy part, y'all. I don't want to hear that again. I want y'all to listen to the question. Why is it that we're no longer obligated to do anything in paradise? Rashida, try it now. We're no longer obligated to do those things in paradise because we already passed that test. There we you go. That this the paradise is not a testing ground, you guys. You guys have to use the right wording. This is the problem. The people of the Tsuna, those people who truly, who are, and this is a problem I see with all, a lot of diet. It's only a handful of us that can communicate for correctly. There are, a lot of people say, Sister Layla, are there other people of the Tsuna that we can listen to? Yes, but there's a big problem. Either they cannot express themselves well in English, cause they got horrible accents or they speak English, but they don't have English comprehension skills, which is why my mother made me go to school and major in, I hated it, English and, 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 and communication. We don't know how to communicate, okay? The innovators, the people who teach and who are teaching the, the people wrong, they have, beautiful diction. They have beautiful communication skills. They have beautiful smiles. Their accents don't even exist, but they're teaching wrong. They're giving wrong information. The people who know the truth, we can't express ourselves right. We don't catch words like obligation. We don't use the words the people need to hear. I don't want to hear about enjoyment. Break it down like Rashida did. We passed the test in life. Y'all understand? You guys who are learning Islam and its truthfulness, you're gonna have to learn how to speak well. I had a person, two people, believe it or not, two brothers of this website volunteered to teach the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa One, I had to say no to because he can't communicate well. And the, this, this, to learn the life of the Prophet is so important. You're gonna have to be able to break that Arabic down into grassroot English and that this person can't do it. His English is horrible. Then the other brother who wants to teach it, he used to teach here before. And you guys know him, he wants to teach it. He, Layla, I'll come back and teach the Surat the Rasul. I'm telling him no, because he don't have the knowledge. His knowledge ain't correct. The other one has the knowledge, but he can't communicate it. It's always a problem. The only person I give that to is brother Mukhtar, my cousin. Other than myself, the only person that myself and Sheikh Morsi will allow to teach that is Mukhtar. Because Mukhtar comes from me, my moths, my people. We were drilled in how to communicate. We were taught as kids to be able to break the message of Islam down in plain, simple, grassroot English. So that's why I had to turn down one, two people here who are people of knowledge, 
but I'm sorry. One, you can't, you just can't get it together. The other one, brother, I know I used to let you teach here, but you ain't all that in a bag of chips. I'm sorry. Okay. Communication is important, especially when you're dealing with non-Arabic speaking people. You have to know that English. You have to be able to pick up on words like obligation. You got to be able to use the word that appeals most, most to a person. If I tell you that you don't have to be tested no more, that's a more powerful statement than saying, uh, we don't have to do none of that no more because we earned the love of Allah. If I say like Awa said, we earned the love of Allah. Is that more powerful than me telling you, you ain't gotta be tried and tested? Which one impacts you more? Which one impacts your heart more? So we have to know how to pick the right wording, guys. And this is what the Daya who are teaching the truth, many of them can't do that. Kareem Abu Zayi can, alhamdulillah. Abu Sama can, alhamdulillah, Khalid Yassin and them can, alhamdulillah, they're grassroot English like me, okay? But a lot of these other brothers can't do that, okay? Y'all have to use the right wording, okay? It impacts a person more to say, you don't, you already have passed your test in life. That's more impacting than saying, because you earned the pleasure of Allah. People don't know what pleasure means. Remember, we are a simple race, a simple-minded people. The prophet said, we don't have the intelligence that the Christians and Jews have. We are more simple-minded. So we have to use more simple words, like you passed your, tr your test, rather than saying, I earned the pleasure of Allah. What does that mean, pleasure of Allah? What, what, what is she talking about? But if I say I pass my tests and trials, oh, you know what I'm talking about. And that's why I can't have just anybody teaching on this website. When you teach here, you got to know how to communicate. You have to have the knowledge, number one, and then you have to have the delivery. If you ain't got the delivery, like Sheikh Morsi said, you can't do it here. Dr. Asim, alhamdulillah, has great delivery. He's been in America. His English is perfect. Okay, plus he knows the Quran. He has a PhD in the Quran. He speaks Futa. Okay, but a lot of other people don't have that diction. Okay, and I can't have him teach that class. Mukhtar, inshallah, I'm praying Mukhtar will teach that. I'm teaching y'all about the Prophet Muhammad as a man, his character, his man, his behavior, and all that. Inshallah, we can have Mukhtar teach y'all his life story from childhood up but I'm not gonna give that to just anybody. It's gotta be someone that can communicate. All right, so the obligations. So this statement is false, false. There will be, as Sister uh, Rashida said, be no more obligations in paradise because we passed the test. In this world, we have proven, not don't say earn the pleasure of Allah. What does that mean? We have proven that we believe in Allah. So instead, the people will worship Allah because they want to and they enjoy doing it not because they have to so again your delivery is everything and you guys inshallah the future of the quran and sunnah y'all have to learn how to speak like the innovators the innovators have perfect english and they know how to use the right words y'all better break it down better okay next question what will be the best thing? What is the best thing of paradise? The best thing of paradise will be seeing what? Who can answer that? Good job. The best thing in paradise will be seeing Allah's face. 
Okay. You got some evidence? Hey, you got some evidence, Norto. Give me a hadith for Norto. The best, excuse me, best thing of paradise will be, Sister Anab, go ahead. It will be seeing Allah's face because you said the people in hell will not be able Don't to say see you Allah's said. Face. Is that evidence? Is what Layla Nasheba said? Is that Dalil? Who is Layla? Layla ain't nothing but no, a piece of dirt. But... Give me some Dalil. Uh, let me see if Anissa got Dalil together. Denisa, give me some evidence. Allah will remove a veil from his face and we'll be able to see him. Excuse me. That's well, not evidence. That's you talking now. I mean, that's, that's what the prophet, in Islam, uh, the, the, the prophet in Islam said. Allah will remove the veil from his face. After well, how we, is that after, shown, after, after Allah has shown us paradise and our gardens. And okay, thank you. Hang up the mic. Do you guys see the problem? Y'all's delivery sucks. The people are the Sufi, you know these answers, but y'all can't express yourself. But if I bring in a Sufi, oh, then the best thing of paradise will be that we will have, you know, oh, they will speak so beautifully and, and be able to rule. You guys have a problem. Okay, let, uh, let me see who else didn't answer. Uh, Marianne, what is the best thing of paradise? Uh, will be the best thing to see and give me the evidence. Oh, okay. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim where the prophet said, um, when the people of par paradise into paradise, Allah will say, do you want anything more? They will say, have you not made our faces white? Have you not admitted us to paradise and saved us from the hellfire? Then the veil will be lifted and they have been giving anything more than looking at their Lord. Okay, Anissa, did you see how she answered that? I, a nab yeah, I was just coming at it a different way. No, you, your way <laughs> was wrong because you didn't, you okay. was making up stuff. I want you guys to remember the hadiths. You didn't mention nothing of what she said. You were just fiddle faddling your own words. You know, when I asked for Dalil, tell me what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, or give me a verse from the Quran. And we went over so many hadiths yesterday, so many verses of the Quran, that hadith that she gave you. See how she said it? She even told you the source, Bukhari. She even threw the source in there. She didn't fiddle faddle around with her answer. Y'all got to do better than this. So go ahead and say it again. And Anissa, listen to how she answered. You didn't come at it that way. Give it again so I can type it. Go ahead, Miriam. The prophet said, oh, The prophet said, when the people of paradise enter paradise, Allah will say, do you want anything more? They will say, have you not made our faces white? Have you not admitted us to paradise and saved us from the fire? then the veil will be lifted and they would have never been giving anything more dear to them than looking at their Lord. Exactly. That's the hadith I wanted. I told y'all to remember after we have been placed in our gardens and on our level, the people will be so surprised and happy to see the wonderful things. And then Allah will, you know, will ask them, is there anything else? And they will say, no, how can there be anything else better than this, so Allah? You didn't say that, Anissa. And there's no other way to go around it but this way, because the prophet was detailed. And the prophet and Allah will answer and say, yes, there is something else better than this. And that's when he will let them know. He said, you you will, will have earned my love and pleasure, and that's when he will reveal his face. So well, you guys can't just fiddle faddle and fibble faddle around. You got to get right to the nitty gritty, like those innovators do, like those famous men that y'all listen to on YouTube, who y'all think are scholars. And these men are not scholars. They're just a bunch of men, most of them of Arabic descent, with their shaved beards or their trim beards who support gay rights and all that, but they got all these Arabic and beautiful smiles and beautiful dictions because you guys paid for them to go and get PhDs in, in, in how to talk, you know? 
You listen to them tell you all kind of crap. Y'all better work on that. Okay, so yes, after we enter paradise, the law will ask them, is there anything else they want? And they will ask him, what can be better than this? And that's when he will show himself. Okay, and number 10, let's see who picked it up because I tried not to talk about it. The best thing the people of paradise will be told is what? Who can remember that? What's the best thing of all? After we see Allah's face, what is the best thing that we will be told upon entering paradise? Norto. Anab. Latifa. Let's say uh, the best thing you will be told is that you earned the love and pleasure of Allah. Which means? Latifa, wake up. You know this answer. <laughs> hey, that's what I know is that you earned the pleasure of Allah. Fam <laughs> uh, what will be the best thing that the people are told? Allah will tell them that he will never be displeased with them again. Yes, meaning no more tests no more trials that's the best thing guys what does it mean to earn the pleasure of allah it means that you've proven yourself no more tests no more trials why does the law send trials to us dr asim spoke about this last week last friday allah test us as a means of us proving to him that we believe in him and that we put him first. That's why Allah sends hardship to us, to those of us who believe. For the unbeliever, the tests and the hardships are punishments from Allah. But for those of us who believe in Allah and who practice our religion, the bad things are purification for us. So the best news that we will receive in paradise is when Allah says, guess what? You've earned my pleasure, meaning no longer will I test you. No longer do you have to prove yourself to me. Enter into your gardens in happiness and in joy. You don't have to worry or wonder, you know, if I'm pleasing Allah anymore. You don't have to wonder if you loving somebody more than Allah. You don't have to wonder if this is haram or that is haram. You don't have to wonder you are have passed. You're, this is it. There's no more proving because that's the whole purpose of our creation, guys. We were created to prove to Allah that we believe in him. That's what this world is, the testing ground. So the best news that the people of paradise will receive is when Allah says you've proven yourself, you've earned my, my, my love and joy. And he will tell us that after he takes that veil off his face to show us how he looks. Isn't that beautiful? Exactly, Sakina. You've passed your test. You won. You're one. That's it. Life ain't nothing but a game. That's why it's called the game of life. Life ain't nothing but a game of thrones. Why was that one of the best movies or best series and best books written? Because it shows, you know, the character, the nature of the human being. Life is a game of thrones. It's all about who can be in power. Who can out trump who? Who can out top who? You ain't got to go through that no more. Allah says compete with each other in doing good deeds. We've spent all our time in this world competing, playing the game of thrones. We don't have to play the game of thrones no more, guys. You have earned, you have proven yourself. No more game of thrones. Go take that throne over there that you deserve 
and you ain't got to fight for it no more. You ain't got to worry about anyone taking it from you no more. The Game of Thrones. Everybody understand this stuff? Okay, that's why you got to understand the meaning of these simple words. Break it down. Okay, any questions about any of these answers? Okay, today is the last lecture, and it's not going to be long. Um, what I'm going to do is take up where we left off yesterday. Yesterday, we spoke about how when we enter through the gate, according to the deeds we did the most, the angels will tell you what garden you are assigned to. You will then be taken to your garden. And when you get to that garden, another angel will tell you what levels are yours. Some of us have more than one level. Some of us will have more than one garden. And once we enter that level and, you know, to live our lives, let's pick up from where we talked about. We talked about how, let me put the PowerPoint up first. Hold on. This is the last uh, of, of this. Hold on. Let me open it. This is it. Yeah. Make sure I got it on my desktop because y'all know how this is, man. From beginning, there it is. So this is the final session of this series on hell and paradise. It'll be session 44, the prayer. And this also proves that we do pray in paradise too. So as I said, we talked about how, first of all, in order to enter paradise, we don't have to give up all the pleasures of this world to earn paradise. And I have to stress this because there are many Muslims out there. If you listen to some of these brothers and, and some of these uh, sisters uh, talking about paradise, they'll tell you that you got to give up the good things in this world. That's not true. That's not true. You don't have to give up the lawful good things in this world. Look at Uthman. Uthman was a multimillionaire. He was the richest of all Arabs. Uthman lived a beautiful, luscious life. That's one of the reasons why the prophet married two of his daughters to him. Because couldn't nobody maintain a woman like Uthman. He gave them the most beautiful life they could ever want. Okay, so we can enjoy the good things here on this earth. The problem is don't allow our love for those things to come between our obligations to a law. So when you come upon Muslims telling you, for example, a stock law, I'll never forget guys, I have the Louis Vuitton collection. I'll never forget I went to a mosque and I had my computer because I was went to the mosque to give a lecture. And I had a, my computer, I got a, a Louis Vuitton computer bag. It's a $4,000 bag. That bag, that bag cost $4,000. But I didn't have to buy it. It was a gift given to me by one of my friends, my sister from Kuwait. She bought it for me as a present. Kuwaiti people are rich. They can do that. $4,000 ain't nothing. But anyway, I went to the mosque and I had my laptop in my Louis Vuitton computer bag. And one of the sisters, when she recognized it was a Louis Vuitton, she said, a stock for law. You're going to go to hell. I said, for what? She said, this is extravagance. A stock for law, that's a $4,000 bag. This is a waste of money. I said, excuse me. First of all, you don't know what the word extravagance means. Extravagance means to live above your means. I told her, you don't know how much money I make. You don't know what I got in the bank. You don't know what's above my means or not because you don't even know who I am. She didn't even know that I was a woman that was coming to do the lecture. I said, you don't even know who I am. I said, find out the meaning of the word extravagance. I told her just because you're a Muslim does not mean you can't have nice things. What Allah forbids us from doing is buying things that we can't afford putting ourselves in debt or living above our means or squandering our money. I told her, this is not a squander of my money and you don't know what I can afford. I, she didn't even know, I didn't even buy it. It was given to me as a gift, a Ramadan gift. That was a Ramadan gift. 
So when you come upon these type of Muslims that want to make you think that in order to get to paradise, you have to be poor. I want you guys to tell them, listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, who has forbidden the adornment of clothing given by Allah, which he has produced for his servant? Who has forbidden the lawful things of food? Tell them they are in this life of this world for those who believe. And they are exclusively for the believers on the day of judgment. So again, you know, just because I live a nice lifestyle, you know, I deserve this. The good things in this world are for the believers. Long as it's lawful and good, good and clean, it's lawful, it's for us to enjoy, like Uthman. In fact, this is one of the things they attack Uthman about. They murdered him, accusing him of being extravagant and all that. He was a multi-millionaire. He could afford anything. He, he was the richest Arab. But people are ignorant that way. So you don't have to shun having a nice life in this world to make it to at paradise. In fact, the prophet Muhammad taught us moderation. In fact, he taught us that one of the supplications that he used to say is, oh Allah, give me the good of this world and give me the good of the hereafter. The prophet Muhammad encouraged us to ask for the good of this world and the good of the hereafter. So I want y'all to remember that. You know, the road to paradise is not paid by you shunning the good things here. And as we talk about, okay, somebody, uh, well, y'all take the moderators, moderators, moderators. Yes, oh, I got to do it. Ain't no moderators here. Okay, please, y'all watch these mics. Y'all know what happens every time we teach. Okay. And we spoke yesterday about how uh, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained that the best thing that the people of paradise will experience is the seeing of the face of Allah. Well, guess what? After we reach our level and after we behold the things Allah has for us and after he shows himself to us, what will the people do? What will be our response? What will be our response after learning that we will no longer be tested in this world? What will be our response? Well, the response will be that we will all do a prayer of thanks. And here's the Dalil again, that we will pray in paradise. Allah tells us that after we see all the wonderful things he's prepared for us, he said the people will raise their voices in praise and glorification because Allah will let them know that it's no more proving. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning. They will say all the praise and thanks be to Allah who has removed us from all grief, for our Lord is indeed all forgiving and ready to appreciate the good deeds, who out of his grace has lodged us in homes that will last forever, where hardship will never touch us and tiredness or fatigue will never touch us. This is the prayer of thanks that we will all give once Allah uh, reveals himself to us and tells us that there's no more proving ourselves to him. And then the people of paradise will conclude their prayer by saying, Alhamdulillah, listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning. They will say all the praise and thanks be to Allah who has fulfilled his promise to us and who has made us inheritors of this land. We can live here. Well, how excellent a reward for us, the pious. 
And then Allah says, the people will say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And what does that mean? That means praise be to Allah, the Lord of the world. So again, I tell you guys, be careful of these people y'all listen to. For this man to tell y'all that there's no prayers in paradise, no praying, and that's what we will spend most of our time doing. We'll be saying, Alhamdulillah, Alameen, a lot because of the wonderful things there. We'll be going to that marketplace every Friday, just like me and go to Juma here. They'll be going to Juma every Friday, listening to Kutbahs from Moses, Noah, Jesus, the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even Abu Bakr give a Kutbah here and there, uh, Hassan, Hussein for the kids, the youth, Umar. Subhanallah, Hamza. We'll have the same actions of worship, but we'll do them out of gratitude, not out of obligation. The women and men will congregate. Even when we enter, we will stand together as one on all our different levels in our different gardens. We will all stand as one and do a prayer of thanks to Allah. And we will end it with Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, SubhanAllah. So this is what Allah has told us and taught us about paradise and also what he's told us and taught us about hell. You know, again, Allah and his prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went into such detail about paradise and hell because as the prophet said, whatever is going to destroy you, I warned you of it. But whatever is going to bring success to you, I've told you of it. So struggle as a nation and make me proud, he said. Make me proud, he said. Make me proud on the day of judgment to see my people coming through the gates of paradise because I didn't just complete my mission by telling you this. I'm also completing the mission of my brothers who came before me, Moses, Abraham, Jesus, Solomon, David. So make me proud, Muslims. Fear Allah. Handle your trials with dignity. Handle your calamities with dignity, knowing that that's why you were created. That's why you were put on earth. Knowing that Allah is not going to put a trial on you that's too great for you to bear. Knowing that you can handle whatever Allah sends you. Make me proud, O nation of Muhammad. How many of us? will do that. Every one of us should work on trying to be that one person, that one person, that one person out of every thousand that make it to paradise. Make our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, proud and make a lot of proud. All right, I'm going to stop right here. Uh, inshallah, this concludes our series on paradise and hell. Tupana kalahuma wa biham dika, ashadu an la ilaha ila anta, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.